leading through love. Let's be real here tonight. Sometimes it is hard to love people. In ministry, it can be especially hard to love people. You know, when you're in leadership, you will always have faithful people uh, who love you no matter what, no matter the criticism, no matter the hearsay. And then you will have the critics themselves, the uh, billy goats, the, uh, as uh, Peter said, uh, stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart, Pharisees, I'm just kidding. But it, it's easy to love those who love you. It's easy to care about those who care about you, uh, to serve those who serve for you. But what about those who are a thorn in your flesh? Those who lack respect and honor, those who are grievous to look after. If we are to be honest with ourselves here tonight, our love eventually runs dry. But the good news is that God's love will never be exhausted. And if you're thankful for that, I want you to take a praise break here tonight. Our love in and of ourselves will often run dry, but the love of God, it just keeps flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing. And sometimes it helps to get real with God. I believe that we can be real with a God who is real. I believe that sometimes it helps to be real with God and say, God, I can't love this person anymore. And God says, okay, now I can love through you. And the love that will be brought forth will not be love of your own, but it will be my love flowing through your life. And if you're thankful for the love of God here tonight, can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Now, there are three kinds of love that are spoken of in the word of God. Number one, you have eros love, which is a romantic type of love. And then you have phileo love, which is a friendship kind of love. But then you have agape, which is the God kind of love. It's the unconditional, unlimited, sacrificial giving of oneself to another. And so God wants his love, the agape love of God, that, sacri that sacrificial love to flow through your life. God's love for you is unlimited, but oftentimes our love for people is limited. I've found that, that we like love and grace in theory, but not in actuality. We like the idea of showing grace. We like the idea of showing love, but when it comes to actually showing love and grace, that's when we get a little uncomfortable. But God, he wants his love to flow through us. Our, our greatest purpose on this earth is to be a reflection of God's love to those around us. How will they know if we are his disciples? It's not by position or power or influence or gifting or calling or education or social status. Although all of those things have their place, but they will know you by whether or not you have the love of Christ operating in your life. John chapter 13 and verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Amen. That's how they will know whether or not you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, whether or not you have love one for another. I think sometimes we think about ministry as just being about influence in a, a higher position and climbing the ecclesiastical ladder and getting a bigger position and a higher position and more influence and more follows and more likes. But leadership is so much more. It's about being more like Jesus and allowing the love of Jesus to flow through your life. Can I tell you this here tonight? It's a very dangerous thing when we have a, 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 a growing ministry, but we have a shrinking relationship with Jesus. I'll say that again. It's a dangerous thing when we have a growing ministry, but we have a shrinking relationship with Jesus, and that can't happen. Where God, he's blessing you and he's given you more increase and more influence. And all of a sudden, that personal, intimate relationship that we had with Jesus just becomes more and more dim and begins to shrink more and more to the point where we're no longer doing what we're doing to help people and to minister to people. But now it becomes about us. We're no longer sing, singing how great thou art. We're singing how great I am. And we think about how we can look better and how we can become greater. But the Bible says, whoever 
whoever is greatest among you must become the least of all and the servant of all. And so if you want more, then you got to go down. If you want to go up, you got to go down. If you want to have a bigger impact, then it comes through humility. The Bible says to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. Amen. God will give you more whenever we are prepared and we're ready to receive it. First John chapter four and verse seven. First John chapter four and verse seven says, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. To whom much is given, much is required, and the more grace and the more love and the more mercy that we receive, the more grace and the more love and the mercy that we ought to give to those around us. That's the love of Jesus. That's the life of Christ flowing through you. Leadership, it is so much more than preaching. You know, I used to think in seminary, uh, when I get out into ministry, it's going to be 90% preaching and then 10% everything else. And then I came to find out that it's actually the other way around. You get so busy doing everything else, and then you're like, oh, yeah, I got to preach this morning. <laughs> and so ministry is so much more about more than preaching. God has called us to, to build relationships, to bear one another's burdens. You know, the, the early church uh, devoted themselves to fellowship. You see that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Uh, the early church was a church of, of fellowship, and a church of, of unity, and a church of growth. You know, I, I recently put out on social media specifically, you know, about how, you know, we, I think sometimes we have a hard time realizing certain tradition in the church world, things that we get caught up in. And, and it really wasn't until I became a pastor that I began to realize what was actually tradition and what's actually in the word of God. And, you know, one of those things that I found is that some people, they get super critical when a church has a section for coffee and fellowship. If you have coffee in a church building, they automatically think that you're a, a seeker sensitive church, a, a worldly church. They got no problem with a potluck. But if you drink coffee, you're of the world. Can I tell you something? There's no difference between having a potluck and having a cup of coffee. The only difference is one is more culturally relevant. Amen? Amen. But, you know, people, they get so caught up in this tradition. They, they think, thus saith the Lord, you have to wear a tie every time you preach. Show me one verse where Jesus ever wore a tie. Show me one scripture where Paul or Peter or James or John ever wore. I'm not against wearing a tie. I'll, I'll wear a tie if I feel like wearing a tie. But you know what? If I'm not wearing a tie, souls will still get saved. The word of God will still go forth. And when the heroin addict walks in the door and the cocaine addict, walks in the door and the meth addict walks into the door and the alcoholic has beer cans rolling out of their car on their way into church. They ain't going to care if you're wearing a tie. They're not going to care if you're wearing a skirt or you're wearing jeans. They're not going to care if you got short hair or long hair. They're not going to care if you have a little bit of makeup or no makeup. Just give me Jesus. They've got to hear the word of God. We're here to give people Jesus. We're not here to give people tradition. We're not here to give people religion. We got to see souls saved. I'm not trying to make more people look like me. Paul said, I became all things to all men that I might win some. We, we got it backwards in the church. We say we want everybody to look like us that we might win them. I just want to see souls saved. I want to see lives transformed by the power of God because that's the heart of God. By the way, the tie wasn't invented until 1,600 years after the Bible was written. Made in the 1600s. 
But all of a sudden, people start wearing ties to church, and then it becomes a standard of righteousness to where if you're wearing a tie, then you're righteous. If, you know, and some people say, well, you know, we got to respect the house of God. You've got it backwards. You are the house of God. Wherever you go, you are the house. The Bible says that David danced naked before the Lord. Amen. Wherever you are, you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwell in, dwells in you. I, I believe in being presentable. I believe in dressing respect. But you got to have a careful balance in in 2022. You got to ask yourself the question: Am I effectively reaching this generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because you can hold on to your tradition until your church dies and you're down to two people and you have no younger people in your church. But is that really what it's about? And is it really worth it? Or are you willing to say, "I'm willing to do. I'm willing to sacrifice my own traditions and my own preferences and my own customs to receive for people to receive the gospel." Of Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that? I'll get back to my notes now here tonight. So the early church, they, they devoted themselves to fellowship. The early church, uh, they built relationships with one another. And in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23, Jesus prayed for our, our oneness to be patterned after the Trinity. Just as he, as one with the Father, he prayed that we, as a church, that we would be one, that we would be unified in the Spirit. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so we're commanded not to forsake relationship with one another. It, it requires spending time with one another. Amen. You know, sometimes people show up to church and then once the cameras turn on, they get in church mode and then the cameras turn off and they just go home like they don't know anybody and there's no fellowship and there's no communion. You are, we are a body. We are the family of God. And so leadership is not a performance. It's about building a spirit filled community and building relationships with like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Amen. Now there's a lot of hurting, broken people out there. One of the reasons why it's so important to lead with love. And really that was a phrase that dropped in my spirit probably about two years ago. It was a phrase, lead through your love, lead through your love. There are a lot of hurting and a lot of broken and a lot of messed up people, broken lives. And you know, when you're in ministry, you, you hear about problems even more because people you know, open up and they share about what they're going through and they share about the hardship and they share about the suffering. And so that's so important that, that, that hug that you give that person that walks in the door, that might be the only hug that they get. You might be the only person with compassion and love in their life. And you know, people, they're looking for something real. They're looking, it's ultimately the love of Jesus that they're searching for. And so you ought to let the love of God flow through you. By this, they will know whether or not you are my disciples, whether or not they have love one for another. But I want to say this here tonight, that although we devote ourselves to love, to never forget to look out for your personal well-being as well, because otherwise you yourself can experience burnout. And, you know, one of the things that I learned probably my first few years of uh, full-time evangelism was to, to set healthy boundaries in my life. As a pastor, you have to establish them probably even more so because otherwise you can spread yourself so thin that you get burnout and then it, that doesn't help anybody. And you know, I, I was in a place, it was probably six or seven years ago. And you know, I, I was literally, I was nonstop. I was going from one plane to the next plane, from one country to the next country. And I was I went through a season of burnout where the last place I wanted to be was from behind a pulpit. And, I, you know, I remember I was in Destin, Florida, and it was my last day there. And before I went back to Baton Rouge, I said, you know what, I think I'm going to go to the beach and relax for a little bit. And as I'm there, there were a couple of people next to me, and, and that happened to be a pastor next to me. And, you know, I've shared this before, but sometimes you can find yourself being the most open and honest and transparent with people that uh, you had just met and that you'll probably never see again on that plane, that airplane, you start confessing your sins and, you know, going through a counseling session because you can just tell them all their, all your problems and you don't have to worry about it. 
And, uh, you know, I, I remember I, I remember just being open and honest and, and told them, I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in full-time evangelism, but I'll be honest with you, the last place I want to be right now is standing from behind a pulpit. And, you know, he said, I got a friend I'd like to introduce you to because this friend was a full-time missionary to Papua New Guinea and suffered severe burnout. And, and you know, I think it's really important to... For those who are going out into missions and going out on the mission field, it's so important to get, you know, a heads up on what to expect because, you know, oftentimes you don't think about the challenges, especially people uh, who go out on the mission field for like six months or a year at a time. I, you know, the Russian Ukrainian community uh, amazed me because many young Russians and Ukrainians uh, right out of school, they go into their Bible college and then right after that, they get sent out onto the mission field. They go, there's about 30 different countries, one particular organization uh, I'm connected with that, that, that they send them out to, and they go out there for like six months or a year. And there are so many pressures that come with the mission field. Going there, being away from your loved ones, the people you care about, you're in a different culture, you're eating different food, the, the people, they speak a different language, you don't sense that same uh, connection, you get tired, you get worn out. And, and, and you got to be really careful because uh, you can suffer severe burnout. And, you know, I've heard of missionaries going out on the mission field. And then once they get back from the mission field, they, they, they go through depression because they feel like nobody relates to them. And they feel like they've lost that connection uh, with people. And so these are some really real challenges that come with the ministry. And, and you know, when I'm on the mission field, I, I, I always try to be an encouragement because sometimes I can detect it. Uh, some people have the mindset, the more you do, uh, the better it is. So, you know, if you only sleep throughout three hours a day, you do ministry from eight in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, then, then praise God, I'm doing the work of God. I'm a bulldozer for the Lord. Well, eventually you're going to crash and burn if you don't take care of yourself. And I saw that happen. I, I experienced this myself. And I, I remember I was staying, it was actually in uh, Mozambique, Africa. First time in Africa, and you know, when you're in Africa, you got mambas and mos mosquitoes and malaria and, and all that stuff, and you, I, I still don't care to go to Africa, but I'll go if I, if I feel like I need to go. But, you know, I remember the mission uh, missionaries I was working there with, they're Russian and Ukrainian, and, you know, they, they purchased bottled water to make sure they had a healthy water to drink, and, and in that particular area, there was a, a hospital that uh, would actually dispose stuff from the hospital into the river that ran alongside of it. All sorts of stuff from the just, just nasty stuff into the river. And the local people, they didn't have any water to drink and they didn't have any water to bathe in. And so they were drinking and bathing in that, in that river. And, you know, the pastor was telling me that they were having to bury about two, he was having to do two funerals every week for children due to sickness or, or malnutrition. And, you know, I remember somebody saying that if we want to reach the people here, then we have to drink what they drink. And I thought, no, 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 no. If God has provided you water, it would be foolish to say, I'm going to, I'm going to drink this water and put myself at, I've gotten sick enough times out of the country to have a mind of my own and think for myself, because if you end up getting sick, you're going to be the one laying in bed, not being able to preach, having to drink Pepto-Bismol. Amen. <laughs> I've learned to trust my gut instinct. If I think I'm going to get sick and a little word of wisdom. If they serve you meat, go for the wings. The reason why is because cats and dogs can't fly. Amen. <laughs> All right. I need to get back to my notes here tonight. And so you got to be careful not to go through burnout. You've got to look out for your own personal well-being. You've got to establish healthy limitations and, and, and don't feel bad about it. Love with all of your heart, but guard your own heart at the, the same time. There is a healthy balance between the two. You can love people and still look out for your own personal well-being. You, you can care for people, but also say, you know, I need to take a break and I need to, I need to come apart. You don't have to, you, you don't have to take every phone call. You don't have to respond to 
every message. You don't have to respond to every text. Sometimes you just need to take a break and you need to get into a solitary place. You need to get alone with Jesus and say, Lord, I've got to hear from you. I've got to disconnect from everything else so I can hear your voice clearly. Amen. Uh, that there, there, there's in ministry, there's consecration. There, there's times where you have to, you have to set to the side and you've got to get alone with God and don't, don't feel bad about it. And you know, a, a pastor is a shepherd, a pastor uh, tends to the sheep, but that doesn't mean that you have to call every time Fifi the cat gets sick. Amen. You're a shepherd. You're not a veterinarian. And as a pastor, it doesn't mean that you have to uh, go out to dinner with every person that you lead. If you do that, if you do that, we're going to have to pray for you for deliverance from the sin of gluttony. Amen. But ever uh, people think that the pastor, the preacher, they have, they, they put so many unrealistic expectations upon the pastor and the leader. And then people feel obligated to live up to their expectations and live up to what people expect them uh, to be. And oftentimes, leaders in ministry, they experience burnout as a result of unrealistic expectations. But the good news is that God does not expect you to live up to their expectations. He just expects you to live up to his expectations and he will give you the grace and he will give you the strength to carry out what he expects you to do. Amen. That, that, that should bring some relief in ministry. Some people, they think you have to as a pastor, as a leader, that you have to do everything. And the reality is that, that we are human beings and we do have limitations and you do have to set healthy boundaries and don't feel bad about it. Don't apologize for it. There are too many people in ministry who have suffered burnout, uh, who, who have fallen, who have messed up uh, because they didn't know when to take a break and they didn't know when to rest in the Lord and they didn't know when to come apart. And as a result, they were the ones who came apart. And so we've got to be sensitive and we've got to recognize what our own personal limitations are. Is this helping anybody here tonight? Amen. You know, if you were to shake every hand every time you preached and, and, and had a conversation about every, everything concerning their life, you would have no time uh, for prayer and you would have no time uh, to get alone with God. And so you've got to, you've got to, to, to set those those limits. And some people, if, if they don't shake hands with every leader on the pastoral staff of the church, and then they say, oh, well, they're, they're, they don't have the love of Jesus. They don't have the love of, no, I, I love you, but I also uh, love you enough to know that I've got to take care of myself uh, in order for me to be a benefit for the body of Jesus Christ. I've got to look out for my own personal well-being, and I've got to look out for my own personal health. Amen. And let me say this here tonight, that love is not defined as tolerance. Sometimes out, out of a love for the whole body, you have to deal with things on an individual basis and some, they might try to guilt trip you, but as a pastor, you're looking at the big picture. Love, it doesn't mean letting everybody have their way. Not, not everybody can see the big picture. Usually it's just a few and sometimes it's just you. Now that's where it gets really fun and interesting. So you want to be a pastor, huh? You want to you want to be used by God. You're going to have to be willing to 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 set the flow. You know, oftentimes uh, preachers and leaders and pastors they they lead from behind on things. But when God calls you to lead and God has called you into the fivefold ministry, you've got to be willing to step out onto the water. And you might be the only one who sees the big picture. Oftentimes, you are the only one who sees the big picture. But you've still got to be obedient to the Lord, and you've got to see what the spirit of God is showing you for the body as a whole. You, you see all this, but oftentimes people only see this. The problem is you can't share this with that people. They won't see it. They won't comprehend. I, I always laugh when churches, they have a, a church vote on every little thing that they do. If you change the color of the carpet and you change the color of the walls and you do this and you do that, they, they, they say, well, we got to have a church vote. We we've got to vote on what color the chairs are going to be. You got the sheep leading the sheep. The shepherd is the one that is called to lead the sheep. And you've got to stand up. People might criticize you. People might call you controlling. People 
people might call you domineering, but, but you've got to lead and you've got to be led by the Spirit of God. Whether people like you or people don't like you, it doesn't change the fact that when you are called to lead, you've got to step up and lead. Amen? The, shepherd, the sheep don't lead the shepherd. The shepherd leads the sheep. The shepherd is the one with the vision and the shepherd has to share the vision with the sheep. Amen? And then people wonder why their church dies out and they, they wonder why the church has no vision and the church isn't moving forward. It's because you got the sheep leading the sheep. The shepherd is the one that leads the sheep. God gives you a vision and then you share that vision. The Bible says that, that when God gave Nehemiah a vision to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, first he kept that vision to himself. But then there came a time when he began to share his vision with the people, and then his vision became their vision. You've got to share your vision. The, the more people know, the more people will care. People will work hard for a what, but they'll give their life for a why. When they know why you're doing what you're doing, then they'll get behind the vision. But you've got to keep leading, and you've got to keep stepping up to the plate. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 14 says, let all that you do be done with love. Let all that you do be done with love. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15 says to speak the truth in love. I love that verse. Speak the truth in love. Some, some, some people only take one half of this verse and other people only take the other half of this verse some people, they just speak the truth, but they don't speak it in love. And then other people say, well, we just want to love everybody, but there's no truth. Well, if you just love people, then you're, you're, you're no better than the California hippies. And if you just speak the truth, you're nothing more than a mathematician. But when you speak the truth in love, then you can fully represent the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You've got to speak the truth and you've got to speak the truth in love, you've got to speak the truth with compassion. You know, Paul, when he addressed the church of Galatia, he was very strong with the church of Galatia. He loved the church of Galatia. The church of Galatia, they were straying and they were falling prey to another gospel. And Paul, uh, he openly rebuked Peter. Peter was a leader in the church. And the rebuke was so strong, it was like a smack across the face. But you know, Paul, he asked them the question, he said, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? Some people, they uh, consider you their enemy because you speak the truth. Speaking the truth does not make one your enemy. Speaking the truth, the Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And somebody who truly cares about you and somebody who truly loves you will tell you the truth even when it's hard to hear it. But you know, when the truth is spoken in love, when the truth is spoken with compassion, it's so much easier uh, to receive. I, th I, I think that we have um, inevitable offense mixed up with unnecessary offense. I'll say that again. <clears throat> we have inevitable offense mixed up with unnecessary offense. There are some things in the word of God that will inevitably offend. When you preach on sin, when you define what sin is, when you say you've got to humble yourself, when you say that your righteousness is as filthy rags, that you got to go to the cross, that's an offense. That's an inev inevitable offense. It, automatically, the Bible says the cross is a stumbling block, but then you have unnecessary offense where the way that you're presenting it is interfering with people uh, receiving it. Something is wrong if your presentation is interfering with people receiving it. And, and one of the most important things in ministry and leadership is asking yourself the question, how can I present the truth in a way that is unbridled, unadulterated, un compromise? How can I present it in a way that people will be more apt to receive it? How can I present it uh, in love and compassion so that people will be more, more apt to receive the truth of the word of God? If you preach the truth without love, then you can cause more damage than you can good. And so you've got to speak the truth in love. And, and, and one of the reasons why walking in love is so important is because it sets an example for the younger generation. What kind of representation are we showing for this next generation? 
uh, leaders. I, I, I believe that, that there is a way to lead uh, people into unity. I believe that it is God's will for the church to be unified. And God, he wants to use you as an example of love, an example of grace, an example of humility. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I love First John chapter 3, verse 18. It says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. But indeed, in a truth. Now, another thing that I've seen with mission work is that you can have one extreme or the other where some, they only focus on humanitarian work, but there's no presentation of the gospel. And then you have the other side where there's a preaching of the gospel, but there's no uh, intention or goal to help them in any other uh, capacity. And, and, you know, sometimes I've heard uh, missionaries and mission work criticized for for building uh, water wells and people say you know they uh, they they could be spending the time preaching the gospel instead of building water wells well what if that was your family out there in Africa what if that was your family in that third world country who didn't have any water to drink there is nothing for them to drink and God sent missionaries from the United States of America who could afford to build a five or ten thousand dollar well for them to have water to drink and so we've got to be careful Paul said let us not love in word only, but in deed and in truth. And so God, he doesn't want us just to preach about his love, but he wants us to demonstrate his love to those around us. Romans chapter five and verse eight, but God demonstrated his love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's no greater representation of love than Jesus Christ. He, even when Jesus was being beaten, and he was being scourged and he was being hung on a cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I, I want you to think about Judas. You know, uh, Judas, Jesus, he, he washed the feet of his greatest enemy. Somebody uh, who was influenced by the devil himself. Judas, he was a backstabber. Uh, he was a, a, a betrayer. You, you know, we have a hard time loving some of our closest loved ones. Uh, our family members and, and our friends. We we have a hard time loving them. And Jesus said, not only am I going to love a backstabber and a betrayer, I'm going to wash his feet. What an example of the love of the unconditional sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of love that God wants to make real in our life and through our life. Amen. Amen. The love of Jesus Christ, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12 says that hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Love covers all sins. First Peter chapter four and verse eight, and above all things have fervent love for one another for love will cover a multitude of of sins. I love Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 17. It says a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. You know, you know what the difference between a friend and a brother is? A friend will be with you on the mountaintop. But a brother will be with you when you're in the valley of the shadow of death. When you're facing the fiery darts of the enemy, when you're, when you're in the fiery furnace, when you're in the lion's den, the Bible says that a brother is born for adversity. We as a church, we've been called to bear one another's burden. We're not called just to show up to church and sing a few songs and clap our hands and, and give in the offering. Praise God for those things. But church is so much more than that. It's about bearing one another's burdens. It's about sharing the love of Jesus. I'm so thankful that two other things I always hear when people walk into this church and they say, I sense the liberty of the spirit and I sense the love of God. Amen. The liberty of the spirit and the love of God. I love what Pastor David Borg told me at, at lunch. He said, 
Brother, I don't know what you're doing, but whatever you're doing, keep on doing it. Amen? You know what we're doing? We're allowing the love of Jesus to flow through us. We're letting the Spirit of God have his way in us and through us. That's what we want as a church. That's what we want as a body of Christ. We want the Spirit of God to flow through The Spirit of God, he's not there just to give you goosebumps. He's not there just to make you shout and to dance and to sing and to worship. The Spirit of God is there to conform you into the image and the character of Jesus. The the Spirit of God is there to make Jesus more real in your life and to make you more like Jesus. That's what the Spirit of God is there for. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor Lauren Larson, he asked me, is it like that every service? I said, yes, sir. Every Sunday and Wednesday. That's what we want people to sense when they walk in here. We want them to sense the love of Jesus, no matter what they look like, no matter the culture, no matter the nationality, no matter the generation, uh, no matter the social status, no matter the wealth or lack thereof. We want them to come in here and know them. That the, we want them to know that the church is not for perfect people. The church is for messed up people. The church is for hurting. The church is for broken people. You know, I, I've shared it before. They say whenever you have a wound. In order for that wound to heal, number one, you've got to leave it uncovered. And number two, you've got to let the blood flow. Anytime you walk in this door, you ought to leave it all uncovered. Uh, uh, you might be wretched and miserable. You don't got to cover it up. You don't got to put on a front. When you walk in these doors, you can leave it uncovered and say, Lord, let the blood flow. Let it flow into my heart. Let it flow into my life. Let it flow into my failure. Let the blood of Jesus flow. If you're thankful for that, I want you to take a praise break here tonight. Hallelujah. I feel that here tonight. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, it says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. One another, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 tells us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. The very first fruit that's mentioned in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 is the love. When you have the Spirit of God flowing through you, it will produce the love of God. You still with me here tonight? First John chapter 3 and verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brother. Jesus said, just as I laid down my life for you, you ought to lay down your life for the brethren. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Amen. You want to be used for the glory of God? You know what it's going to cost you? It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you your life. It's more than Sundays. It's more than Wednesdays. It's more than posting quotes on social media. It's going to cost you your life. A good shepherd gives it all. Jesus said, I gave it all for you, and you ought to give everything for your brethren. Hallelujah. First John chapter 4 and verse 12, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. You know, there is nothing more classy or powerful than showing forgiveness and grace to those who do not deserve it. When you show grace and love and forgiveness to those people who do not deserve it. That's one of the most powerful things that you can do. When you forgive those who wrong you, Jesus said, I don't want you just to be kind to your enemies. He said, I want you to love your enemies. He was willing to wash the feet of his greatest enemy on this earth. Are you willing to actually love your enemies? I love what my friend Gabe Swagger says. He says, when people sling mud at you, don't get in the pig pen with them. And don't sling mud back. Just walk on by. Amen. Just keep going on with Jesus. Just keep doing what God has called you to do. Your calling is greater than any of that mess. And you ought to walk worthy of the calling in which he has called you. Amen. You've got to, you've got to invest your time and your energy in the work of God and the sheep of God. Those who are hungry for the word of God. Those are the people you ought to focus on. Those are the people you ought to invest in. Those who want to hear the word. Those who you are hungry for the presence of God. You, you, you know, one of the things I found in ministry is that when leaders get a personal offense with somebody, 
then they often use a pulpit to blast everybody, and then everybody gets whiplash, and they're like, where did that come from? <laughs> and you know what? When somebody is dishonorable, they are not worth your ministry. They are not worth your investment into ministry. It's not worth affecting everything that you've invested in over something dishonorable. You've got to focus on the sheep of God. You've got to lay aside the personal offenses and say, when I'm behind the pulpit, I've got to feed the flock of God. I've got to give them what they need to hear. I'm not here uh, uh, to vent all my personal frustrations. I'm here to feed the flock of God, feed them the word of God. I want to give them what they need. Amen. Uh, so many people, their ministry and their platform is built on hurt and offense and bitterness. And they wonder why people can't take it anymore. You've got to, I love what Miss Doris said a, a few weeks ago. She said, you got to keep your heart healed in, in ministry. Amen. No matter what you're going through, no matter what kind of offense you face, you've got to keep your heart healed. Because when you're standing behind the pulpit, you've got to give people what they need to hear. There, there's only so much toxin and, and bitterness that people can handle. And, and, then, and then people don't show up to church anymore and people say well they don't want to hear the truth well maybe it's not because they don't want to hear the truth maybe it's because you're full of bitterness and hurt and anger and you've got to allow Jesus to heal your heart so that when you stand behind the pulpit the people don't see the bitterness they see the love of Jesus flowing through you and they receive what they need from the Lord amen that's how people will be blessed you know, if you preach on television and, and you offend somebody, they just kind of flip the channel. They're probably just sitting on their recliner. They didn't go out of their way to listen to you, and they can just change the channel on you. But, you know, when you got people who drive 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours to show up to church, it shows that there's a hunger inside their heart. It shows that they're there because nobody forced them to show up to church. And so there ought to be something in you that says, I want to give these people what they need to hear. I want to feed the flock of God. I want to preach what's going to minister to their heart. I want to speak the truth in love. Amen. When they walk out that door, I want them to be better when they walk out than when they walked in. When they're worse off, when they leave than when they came, something's wrong. You know, there's a, there's a time for antibiotics, but people can't survive just taking antibiotics. Biotics. There's a time to address things, but people got to be encouraged in the Lord. They've got to be strengthened in the truth of the word of God. They've got to, uh, they've got to be ministered to their hearts have to be ministered to John chapter 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. Singers can come back here tonight. Two more verses here tonight. First Corinthians chapter 13. Verses 1 and 2, Paul said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clinging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. So what Paul is saying here is no matter the gifting, no matter the calling, no matter the function in the body of Christ, you can have all wisdom, you can have all knowledge, you can have more degrees in a thermometer. But if you don't have the love of Jesus, Paul said here, he said, I am nothing. And so the most important aspect of ministry is allowing the love of Jesus to flow in you and flow through you. When you lose your compassion for people, when you lose your love for people, it's a dangerous place. Amen. Amen. It's when we, we got to come to a place and we say, Lord, I, I need you to refresh my heart, refresh my spirit. I can't love people, but if you'll love through me, I'll continue on in the ministry. And his love, it will just keep flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing. When you feel like you can't love anymore and you've exhausted everything, I don't know about you, but sometimes you've loved people for so long and you've seen no change and you feel like I just can't love them anymore. That's whenever the love of Jesus comes in. And he does what we can't do. His love flows through us when our love runs, runs dry. Amen. Would